The Democratic race for the White House is gearing up with the votes in Iowa and New Hampshire starting to winnow the field of candidates and establish new frontrunners. But upcoming contests in Nevada and South Carolina, much more diverse states, could reshuffle the race again. Joining us now from Las Vegas, former Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Mayor, let's start with the numbers from the two states which are going to be holding contests over the next two weeks. Put them up on the screen. In Nevada, you're in fifth place with 10% support. In South Carolina, you're also in fifth place with 7.5% support. You're trailing Tom Steyer in both states. How important is it for you to do well, much better than those numbers, in both of those states to show that you can get support in states with a big minority voting bloc? Well, it's very important for us to do well, and we're on the ground working to earn those good results here in Nevada, and we'll be campaigning hard for every vote in South Carolina as well. We see how fluid it is. Of course, I don't have uh, billions of dollars of my own money to pour into the airwaves, but what we do have is a vision that, as we've demonstrated in New Hampshire and Iowa, uh, can bring people together, and a commitment as we come to more racially diverse states to speak to the concerns of voters who are here. Here in Nevada, for example, we've got got over 100 organizers on the ground, volunteers as we speak, getting ready to go out and talk to fellow Nevadans in a state that looks to the future and in a state where I'm uh, encountering a lot of workers concerned about how these political decisions are going to affect them, uh, whether it's workers who are concerned about health care and how to preserve the health care choice that is so important to them, uh, people concerned about immigration reform and wanting to know that we're seriously going to get something done, uh, and a lot of people looking to the future worried about climate. Uh, this is a state that is uh, in many ways reflective of the future of America and uh, really excited to be on the ground here working to earn that support in the week that remains. How damaging if you don't show strong support among Latinos in Nevada, African Americans in South Carolina, because that question of whether or not you can get support from those minorities, of course, is the big knock on your campaign. Well, I'll leave it to pundits to do the political analysis. What I will say is, of course, it is extremely important to earn support from voters across the board. And when you look uh, at the way that uh, uh, Latino voters here in Nevada uh, know that they are under siege in this administration, uh, talking to black voters who are sick and tired of the economic disempowerment alongside the injustices of systemic racism and looking for a president who can actually bring change to Washington, and more than anything, looking for a nominee who can defeat Donald Trump, uh, we are ready to go out and have that conversation. You know, uh, this more than anything else, I think for so many voters, and certainly a lot of voters that, uh, of color that I talk to across uh, the Latino, the, the black, and the AAPI communities, uh, is about making sure that we get this right. Uh, you know, the, the Senate demonstrated that it's not going to hold this president accountable. Uh, it is up to us in 2020. It is our only shot. And as we see this president, uh, as he's demonstrated interfering in uh, criminal prosecutions, growing more and more emboldened, so much is on the line. We dare not get this wrong. And that means nominating a candidate who can challenge this president on his own terms and put together a big enough winning coalition that we can have some coattails, too, and make gains in the Senate. I, I want to talk about how this race is beginning to shape up, because after two states, it is beginning to shape up. In New Hampshire, the so-called moderate candidates won more than 50 percent of the vote of voters in that state. But, which was double what Bernie Sanders got, but he won in New Hampshire because he had that left lane, the more liberal lane, all to himself, while the so-called more moderate lane was kind of clogged up by you and, and Biden and Klobuchar, all of whom split up the votes. How concerned are you that the, that the moderate lane, if you will, is getting so crowded that you could be leaving the, the road to the nomination open to Bernie Sanders? Well, I think that's what voters right now are in the process of settling. Uh, look, there are a lot of different candidacies with a lot of different visions. But the vision of my candidacy is that we're going to have to bring change to Washington, that we can't confront the most disruptive president in modern times by falling back on the same playbook, just as we also can't do it by uh, telling people that their only options are between a revolution or the status quo. Uh, we've been able to demonstrate our ability to uh, get diehard Democrats, yes, but also independent 
independents and even some Republicans to cross over and support my vision and what our campaign stands for. And I believe that's going to serve us well here in Nevada, South Carolina, and beyond. And then, <laughs> despite uh, if you're able to winnow your way through all of those folks, uh, then on Super Tuesday you face another centrist candidate in Mayor Mike Bloomberg. And over really the last week, week and a half, there have been a, a series of stories about his comments on stop and frisk and redlining. And as I discussed with Kellyanne Conway, a big story in the Washington Post today about a long history of him making sexist, profane comments uh, to women who worked for his company, some of whom said that it created a hostile workplace. How troubled are you by these allegations and this evidence of alleged sexism and racism? Well, I think he's going to have to answer for that and speak to it. Look, uh, this is uh, a time where voters are looking for a president who can lead us out of the days when it was just commonplace or accepted to have these kinds of uh, uh, sexist and discriminatory attitudes. And, uh, you know, right now, this is our chance to do something different. Obviously, there is no comparison to uh, this president and uh, the way that he has treated and talked about uh, women and people of color and continues to do so to this day. But we in our party hold ourselves to the highest standard, and it is going to be critical for us to have a nominee uh, who can authentically lead uh, and who can show growth uh, on these challenges. Look, uh, uh, some of these are uh, uh, issues that our country is about to face are uh, among the most intractable we've ever had, but you've got to arrive at those, uh, at those challenges uh, with, uh, uh, with the ability to explain your record uh, and with an ability to explain how you're going to raise the bar at a time when and uh, we are finally asking a lot more from our elected leaders. Well, uh, let me follow up on that, because Kellyanne Conway was, I think, trolling Democrats and saying, boy, this party that talks about all of these principles and the Me Too era, are they going to nominate somebody like Michael Bloomberg with his record uh, of, of things he's done, for instance, towards women in the workplace, uh, just because they think he can beat Donald Trump? What would that say about what the Democratic Party really stands for? For a representative of this White House to speak about misogyny, to speak about sexism, uh, to speak about racism is comical. And you're right, I think it amounts to trolling. Uh, look, the American people are not going to be fooled by anybody from the Trump White House when it comes to these issues. Uh, so I'll leave it to my competitors in this race to speak for themselves. But one thing we can all agree on is that we can do a lot better than this president. And you know, one of the reasons why I'm seeing a lot of uh, folks from the Republican Party uh, or formerly from the Republican Party ready to cross over uh, is that they can no longer look their children in the eye and explain the behavior of the current president of the United States. Mayor, uh, you have been very open about the fact that you're gay, and it hasn't been much of an issue in this campaign until now. Uh, this week, two conservative supporters of President Trump, Rush Limbaugh and Sebastian Gorka, talked about it on their shows. Take a look. A gay guy, 37 years old, loves kissing his husband on debate stages. Can you see Trump have fun with that? Why is a homosexual man lecturing us about the sanctity of life in the womb? Just a little curious there. Strange. Mayor, what's your reaction to those comments? <laughs> Well, I am in a faithful, loving, committed marriage. I'm, I'm proud of my marriage, and I'm proud of my husband. And I'm not going to be lectured on family values from the likes of Rush Limbaugh or anybody who supports Donald J. Trump as the moral as well as political leader of the United States. America has moved on, and we should have a politics of belonging that welcomes everybody. That's what the American people are for. And I am saddened for what the Republican Party has become if they embrace that kind of homophobic rhetoric. And how big an issue do you think this would be in a general election? Clearly, they think it would be an issue. Uh, the idea that, that you would need and you have reached out to social conservatives, many of whose votes you'd need, but who might have concerns about your sexual orientation. Well, here's my generational or, or general election experience on this. Uh, you know, I came out during a general election in South Bend. Uh, 
And this was at a time when Mike Pence was the governor of Indiana, and we didn't know what would happen. I'll tell you what happened. I got reelected with 80 percent of the vote in my generally democratic but socially conservative community, more than I had the first time that I ran for office. This election isn't about any of us candidates. It is about voters' lives. And we're the ones trying to get voters a raise. We're the ones trying to make sure that there uh, is paid family leave, uh, working to end endless war, serious about climate change, actually prepared to do something on gun violence. And when it comes to LGBTQ issues, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, the most important thing is not the, the treatment of candidates, it's what's happening to individuals and families across the country from uh, brave service members uh, who have their careers right. threatened by this president uh, to kids experiencing bullying right now in this climate. We can do better, and you don't have to be a diehard Democrat to know uh, that we can do better when it comes to inclusion and equality in this country. Mayor, thank you. Thanks for joining us. We'll be watching developments next week out of Nevada. Good to have you. Thanks. Good to be with you.